Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for February the 26th, 2021. This is episode number 47. Our top stories today, Hyundai Ioniq 5 makes its grand debut. Lucid goes public, postpones production of the air. Hyundai Kona Electric gets a total recall. I'm Dominic Chioni, Inside EVs forum moderator and the Inside EVs editor. Uh, joining us today is Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge with Tom Malogny. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. <laughs> so, and as you can see, it was, yeah, we'll add this. Oh, there he is. There he is. No, he's, not, he's gone. Oh, he was there a moment ago. That was his, that was his big build-up. Sean, we gave you a, a <laughs> massive introduction. Well, we were going to. Here, here it comes. <laughs> and... As you can see, if you're watching this on YouTube, we have a special guest this week, Sean Mitchell from All Things EV YouTube channel. Welcome, hey welcome back, welcome hey, back thanks. Sean. Thanks for having uh, me. I'm just getting set up. Plug it in no, the microphone. No problem. Great to see you again. Um, so if, if you like the podcast, uh, please leave us a rating or maybe even a review on whichever platform you catch us on. That helps others discover us and spread the word about EVs. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, we'd love a thumbs up there as well. Okay, so gentlemen of the panel, welcome, and ladies and ladies and gentlemen of the audience, <laughs> welcome to the Inside EVs podcast. Um, so let's kick it off by talking about what's charging in our driveways this week. Um, actually, I'm not sure if we have anything in our driveways this week, but uh, Sean, have you driven anything new recently? Uh, yeah, I had the Mustang Mach-E uh, about a week ago. Okay. That was fun. That was, uh, it was like a four-day four day event, and... Took it up to the mountains, took it around, did some filming. I'm I'm actually quite excited about this one. I think right. they knocked it out of the park in many ways. There are some areas of improvement, in my opinion, but you got to start somewhere. And I think that this is a far better start than Nissan's Leaf or Chevy's Bolt, in my opinion. Oh yeah. Do um so. I don't. Do you want to elaborate on just a little bit, like your experience? What was it that you didn't like about it? Because I, I actually just drove it a couple of days ago, but just like briefly, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But I'm just wondering because mm -hmm. I didn't have enough time to find anything to be critical about, but I wasn't doing like range or anything. Yeah, I can talk about a few things. This is like a sneak peek. I've 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 done this on a on a few oh. occasions when I've been uh, when I've been a guest. I haven't uh, put out the video yet. I finished. Okay. The, I, oh. I finished recording the script a few days ago. I sent it to my videographer. We're gonna do like a little cinematic, cinematic movie. We took the we took the car into the mountains and got some just beautiful backdrop of snow and mountains and pine trees, and so I'm really excited about that. Um, I kind of tie it into my fascination with with Mustangs as early as a high school student, and uh, I begged my parents to to buy me a, a Mustang Mustang 5.0 and. Um, they, they didn't listen. They, they bought me a granny car, but I still loved and enjoyed Mustangs as a kid. And that's carried through to my adult years. And so it's, it's, there's, there's this sort of adolescent tie to this whole experience of getting behind the wheel of a Mustang. And, um, you know, one thing that I think really shines through is, is Ford's, Ford's resume with building vehicles. It just felt solid. It was a solid built car. There were no rattles. There were no shakes. There were no there were no odd things like that. that sometimes you find in in newer automakers, and so that was one of the things that I really enjoyed about it is that you got in the car, and it felt like a real car that was built well. Now you know you can you can you know take into the fact that this is a pre production prototype um, or or early production early production vehicle, but. Uh, build quality was solid. Uh, I, I liked how it had felt driving around. It was spacious. There was plenty of headroom, plenty of knee room in the second row. And the drive was solid. The, the suspension, I was really, really impressed with. It didn't feel like a heavy car. So whatever they're doing there uh, with, with their coil suspension, I think is fantastic. It, it, it just it didn't feel like a heavy vehicle when you go over bumps. Um, right, yeah, they gave me a, a standard range Mach-E and uh, that, that to, 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 to 
it was just a little bit underwhelming. I wish they would have given the extended range, and I'm I'm surprised that they didn't. I'm surprised they don't just give every every right. person reviewing a vehicle the the extended range. So you know, at 210 miles on a on a full charge, it just it 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 left me lacking a little bit more. So that was one area that I think that that um, you know, for fifty thousand dollars, a 210 mile vehicle just doesn't cut it. Right. Uh, so I, I think the 300 miles should be the standard uh, for for every for every electric vehicle that's that's going out on the market, and uh, especially for that price point. So those are a few of my my um, my, my my favorite features and least favorite features. Right on. Cool. And so, yeah, look out for All Things EV, uh, Sean Mitchell YouTube channel for that video when it comes out, because, uh, yeah, that'll be definitely good. You, I love your videos. Um, so, Tom, I know you've driven the Chevy Bolt EUV and EV this week, and, and Kyle, our other re regular co-host, is out driving them today, actually. Um, but I believe you can't really tell us much about them yet. Can you say anything about them at all? Like how they looked in person or how the seats, if the seats are more comfortable than as, or as comfortable as we've been told or. Yeah. Um, I can't talk about driving impressions. Okay. Uh, and to be clear, I didn't drive the bolt EV. Um, oh. it, this was an EUV uh, media drive. They actually had a couple bolt EVs there, but we were not allowed to drive them because they were like a different classification. They were a different type of build and only employees were allowed to drive them. They weren't like certified to let media drive. Uh -huh. So we, we couldn't even, a couple, one of the people asked and, and uh, we said, no, you're sorry, you can't. Um, they used them as like the chase vehicles. They, they, we drove in a formation. This was a very organized and short drive um, where we couldn't vary. Usually they give you the keys, they say, here's the route, but you can vary from it and take pictures. This was different. We were in formation. We couldn't leave the group. And uh, it was it was really strict and short, um, mm -hmm. uh, but what you know um, the the driving impressions were embargoed till Monday, so pretty quickly we'll be able to have some some uh, news out about that. But uh, the vehicle, as far as I was concerned, the EUV, um, well, both of the the new Bolt refresh, I think they did a nice job on it. I, I think the front looks really clean. I really like the the nose on the Bolt now. Yeah. Uh, the interior is all new huge upgrade on the interior. Right. I never liked the Bolt EV's interior. I always thought it looked cheap. And I kind of thought that G Chevy went out of their way to try to make this futuristic looking angular dashboard that this is an EV and, you know, and, and now they kind of said, oh, well, it doesn't have to look crazy to be an EV. Let's just make it look like a nice Chevrolet. Um, so in that regard, I, I, I like what they did. The seats are completely redesigned. Um, and I will say that uh, they're better, but I'll stop at saying that um, okay. the, the rest you'll, you'll hear in our review on Monday. Um, but the EUV, I thought it looked more muscular. Um, that's the play, if you ask me. It's only $2,000 more than the Bolt EV, and uh, it's got much more rear leg room. And it just seems like it has more versatility, that vehicle. Um I like pretty much everything on it. The two negatives that I'll say is that they didn't improve the DC fast charge. It's stuck in 2014 with, with uh, you know, 55 kilowatt DC fast charge. And the EUV should have been available in all-wheel drive. If, if, if they would have made that vehicle all-wheel drive as an, as an option, I think it would have done that much better. But that said, I wouldn't discourage anybody from buying this vehicle. I think it's a good deal uh, it starts at only thirty three thousand nine ninety five. Um, you know that that's yeah. real, really affordable. Uh, so uh, yeah, I I, I I like what Chevy did, but it, it, the one thing I will say is they didn't do anything to really move the needle forward. They made right. a better bolt, but the, nothing's groundbreaking here. Right. Does it surprise you at all that they kept the 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 EV? instead of just doing away and, right. and, and and focusing more on the EUV, because the EUV just looks, it, it, the offering just looks more compelling to me. Yeah, absolutely, Sean. And that was my initial reaction. But then somebody mentioned to me, somebody threw out, well, maybe they're keeping it for like fleet sales. And I was like, ah, yeah. Like uh, I could see the Bolt EV being sold in mass for like, you know, municipal use and fleets where they don't need the extra space. They don't need, you know, the, the EUV uh, vehicle, um, you know, that uh, it's the least expensive form. 
that's extremely efficient and gets, you know, great low running costs. So I, th I think they kept it for that. But um, that's the only reason I come up with because they're so close. I know that picture makes them look like there's a big size difference, but there is not. Right. It's 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 six inches longer, but the height is the same. The width is the same. The interior is exactly the same. When you sit in the car, you can't tell which car you're in. Um, and uh, the only difference interior is is you've got three more inches of rear legroom, but that makes a big difference for families holding uh, kids around and just putting people in the back seat. Well, that that's really the head scratcher to me. They're so similar, and yeah. especially in price. So it's it's almost like two thousand dollar difference, and you've got nominal difference in terms of of, of size. I, I think I heard that the trunk space in the EV is larger than the EUV, and that was another head scratcher for me too. So I, I need to clear that up. I, I talked to the GM engineers about this, and 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 yeah, I I brought this up on last uh, week's podcast. So the the, the technical specifications show that the EUV's cargo space is slightly less. John is saying, what's an EUV? I know, ridiculous. As if we needed another acronym, John. <laughs> is um, that it's, utility it's, vehicle, maybe? Yeah, electric utility vehicle. You know, sport utility vehicle isn't good enough. We need another acronym. So uh, I spoke with GM's engineers about this and said, I, I, like, you're defying physics. It's, it's six inches longer. How can the cargo space be less? You know, it doesn't just doesn't make sense. I can almost see if the cargo space behind the rear seats was less because maybe they pushed the rear seating back. But then once you put the seats down, it can't be less, you know? So he said, actually, it isn't less. Oh, okay. It's okay, but your, you know, the spec, the spec sheet shows it's it's slightly less. So he explained to me, okay, there, you know, there's, there's, you know, 10 different ways to measure cargo space. Um, the way they have to announce it uh, or, you know, present it is by the, um, the SAE's uh, specifications. And the way the SAE determines how you measure the rear cargo spaces, uh, you have to measure the height of the, 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 the roof in the cargo area exactly above the axle. Okay. Um. Now take a look at how the Bolt EUV's roof line tails down and how far back that rear wheel is. So when you measure for directly up from the rear axle, you've already at a point where the roof has sloped down a couple of inches. So that's the height you get. So um, the measurement comes out slightly less than the bolt because you see the rear of the bolt doesn't have an aggressive taper down as much. It, the roof line stay, it stays more consistent. It, it's, it's like an inch or two higher directly over the axle. But the GM engineers told me if you actually measure this, if you put like cargo in it and pack it up to the roof, it's actually maybe 10% more cargo space than the Bolt EV. So we've got to get that th that out there. Yeah. Um, I know so many people are commenting on it. and uh, But the fact of the matter is it's all about how the SAE determines how the measurement happens. I believe there's another couple of specifications where it's where the EUV is smaller too. I don't know if I can't want to say hip room or shoulder room or something, one of those kind of you know, metrics. Yeah. I think uh, Kyle was talking about that last night in our, our company chat. Um, yeah. I, 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 you know, I think it's all how you measure because the, the, the vehicles are the same, you know, except right. the bolt is the EUV is six inches longer. Well, that's great mystery solved then because, and I was looking, I was looking at a bunch of volume numbers last night too. And it's funny where discrepancies were like one vehicle is like bigger, but then it has like less room than other. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so, I actually drove something different this week. I drove my little Chevy Spark EV to the Ford dealership here in Tallahassee and tried out the Mustang Mach-E myself. Um, they only had one on the lot now. They sold all the other ones they had uh, allocated already. Uh, this one, they can't sell until they've got 4,000 miles on it or they've had it for four months. And I believe that's something that goes for like all the dealerships in the country. Um, for sure, out in Colorado where you are, Kyle, uh, somebody out there mentioned that to me. Um, so... So while I'm thinking about it, I would encourage all y'all to call up your local Ford dealer and arrange a test drive. Um, they really want to get miles on these things, so so they can sell them. And I didn't get like the hard sell either. They, I mean, they didn't even take my my phone number or anything. So I'm not even going to get. Sometimes you know, car salesmen are very persistent and good at their jobs, and they'll, they'll you know they'll follow up uh, repeatedly um, if you go for a test drive. But you know, this was a really great experience. There was like no hard sell, and you know, he was, he was really kind of happy to. You know, take people out on the road, and he said that he had. Uh, there had been quite a bit of interest as well, 
um, but they're having a hard time getting them in actually to to actually sell like you they have like this one now and they don't know when to get the next ones so um, but it was a pretty great experience uh, I pulled up and it was sitting right right up on the front by the road and it was a standard size battery like what you had uh, Sean they did have a bigger one there I believe as well and um, and it was rear wheel drive only as well so it had 395 miles on it total and had a 95 percent charge so that was great because uh you know sometimes dealerships in the past have fallen down they'll leave a, a car like with hardly any charge on the lot but this was not the case and this was like a, right around five o'clock or just after five o'clock too so later in the day um i want to say it had 253 miles of indicated range on the dash at 95 percent, but i i should have taken a picture i, I was kind of giddy and just like looking over everything but in any case, it felt really nice inside. There's like soft touch materials everywhere. Uh, like Sean was saying, there's plenty of room in the front seat. I tried at the back seat and there's um, had the glass roof. It was great. There's lots of head space both, both ways and lots of room, even though I was in the, had been in the front in the driver's seat. So I had my the seat back. I'm like six two, I think. And um, so, I, you know, it was comfortably back and I got in the back seat had moved the seat and there's like plenty of a lot of room actually it was very spacious i was like, kind of impressed and then on the side as well there is a you know it looked like there would be plenty of room for three people very comfortably um so taking off was a little odd for me at first it almost felt like the uh, parking brake was stuck on um but it was just set to one pedal driving it, it seemed stronger than on my sparky v in, in the low and max regen uh, we didn't go that far and all the streets were in good shape so i didn't have a chance to really judge the suspension but now that you but hearing sean mention that, that it didn't feel heavy that's it's true it didn't really feel like uh it, it felt like better than the bull tv i'm not sure if that's a you know it's a low bar maybe but uh for the mustang <laughs> but it did feel you know it did feel feel great it didn't feel like it was too much car for the suspension um and i, I did give it the beans a few times and it felt really good um, not didn't have like gut punch acceleration, uh, but it's, it's only the rear drive. Uh, I believe it has a 5.2 second zero to 60. And, uh, there's an uh, annoying torque steer, steer you get with front wheel drive as well. But it just felt, you know, it just felt good. Like, uh, like Mustang. It's like, I, I drove a Mustang a, a couple summers ago on a, on a long road trip and, uh, you know, it had, it had more power than that actually, cause that was a V6 in that. And that felt great, but this, you know, I, don't, I, I like the the quiet power of an electric vehicle. You know, it doesn't, you know, you're not broadcasting. No, it's just, it just does it. You know, and that's actually, I did find it. It did have a bit of a sound, a bit the motor sound. Did you hear? It? Yeah, I, I kind of liked it. It was nice, right? I I actually turned it off. I I've, I've never been a fan of the generic sound, uh, the the engine sound that they that they add to it. They, I think they do the same thing with the the Taycan as well, right. and and the Audi e-tron. And it just I don't know. It, it it feels synthetic, and I love the 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 sound of silence. So I turned that right. feature off as soon as I found it. Right. Um, the the I Pace has it as well. Um, the, but I asked the guy if it, if it was an artificial sound, and he said no. But I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't see the setting on the. We went through some of the settings on on the screen, and I like the screen by the way. It was worked fine, responsive, like a, like you'd expect. Like you know, so, uh, that that kind of thing has come so much so far in the, in the last years. You know, automotive like screens they used to be so terrible, but you know this is pretty nice. Even the the button on the bottom was fine. It's like oh, okay, it's you know kind of. I don't know. People always complain about the knobs, right? There's no knobs. So they gave you a knob <laughs> and it's kind of, maybe some people might see it as gimmicky, but you know, it's kind of, you know, easy to grab. And I, I liked it better than like tapping on the screen for volume control say. Yeah. I, I found the, the, the dial there on the touch screen, a little redundant. Okay. They got volume controls on the steering wheel. So right. the driver doesn't need the, the knob and the passenger, doesn't really need to be worried about distracted driving. So, who's the who's the knob really for? It's almost like, you know, in, in in my upcoming video, I compare it to a stylus on a smartphone. Yeah, you might it might be useful every once in a while, right? But but overall, it's just is not needed in most cases, in my personal opinion. And you know, I, I think I think some people who are transitioning from gas vehicle with lots of buttons to uh, digital or electric electric vehicle, it might be some sort of 
familiarity that they're used to. But you know, I'm I'm now you know five six years into to my Tesla that has no buttons like that. I don't, I just I just found it unnecessary. Right on. All right. Um, let's see. So yeah, there is. So overall, for me, it, like it was a pretty great experience. But I really like to get some more time behind it so I can just you know feel how it is overall. Like it does live with too. Um, like I said, Manhattan. Mine seem to have like a little more range, but it's also warmer here. It was like 70 degrees at the time. Sorry, the rest of the, rest of the country. Um, it's like our spring is about to happen for the next few weeks before summer kicks in in Florida. It was, Tom, just go to another Ford dealership and get a different one. That's true. I wish, I mean, I'd have to travel <laughs> out of town. But I mean, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I should actually, you know, hmm? I, I should, yeah, Thomasville is not that far away in Georgia. <laughs> um, I have like right. 10 Ford dealerships within 20 miles of me. So like I might just hit them all up. <laughs> right. Cause I was kind of hoping that, you know, they'd say take it for the weekend, you know, but it's the only one they have. So they can't really do that. But I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's, it, I was, I was kind of hopeful, but anyway, uh, so let's move on to the news of the week. Um, so I think the big story this week, I think we can all agree, is the debut of the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Uh, this is the first car for the new Hyundai Ioniq sub-brand and the first vehicle to be built on the eGMP platform. Uh, so let me share some numbers and a, a few points, and then we can go around and uh, give our thoughts. So it's a crossover. Uh, I want to call it a low roof crossover. It looks maybe deceptively small in pictures, but it's almost six inches longer than like a, a Hyundai uh, Tucson. And it's almost two inches uh, less tall. It's, it's shorter in length than a Model Y by a little bit, but it's longer than the uh, VW ID4. Um, as far as the dimensions, uh, here's the kicker. The wheelbase is longer than that of the Hyundai Palisade. And that's its, their biggest SUV by like four inches. So the passenger compartment should be super roomy. Uh, the cargo space isn't huge, but okay at 18.7 cubic feet or 529 and a half liters. Uh, fold the seats down, the rear seats down, and they fold pretty flat from what I can tell. So that's cool. Uh, but you can get uh, 56 cubic feet altogether or 1590.8 liters. Uh, that's a lower number somehow than the ID4 somehow. So like we were talking about volumes cargo volumes and things earlier, I wonder what's if there's something going on with that. I don't know, but it's something, something to think about when we get a hold of uh, a hold of one in real life to check out. Uh, Bjorn Island does his famous banana box test. I don't know if you, uh, you have a standard, you know, these whatever standard sets of boxes and how many you can stick in there. So we'll be looking to see how many banana boxes this thing can hold. I think it's gonna do pretty good. Um, but anyway, on to the good stuff. Uh, in most territory markets, it will come with a choice of two batteries, a 58 kilowatt hour and a 72.6 kilowatt hour. The larger battery is said to be good for a range of 470 kilometers or 292 miles uh, and 480. Oh, yeah. Oh, so they give a range of a, a range of range. Um, so, yeah, 292 to 298 miles under the WLTP cycle. Uh, that's in the all wheel drive version, the rear wheel drive version will likely go farther or further farther uh, okay for some reason north america will also get a slightly bigger battery almost five more kilowatt hours at 77.4 kilowatt hours and we don't have the epa range figures for that yet but um i mean i'm hoping they can peg that 300 number you know because i know their past vehicles have been pretty efficient like the Kona electric which aren't from the ground up electric um but they've but are we have a lot of uh, owners in the inside EVs form and they report you know 325 350 miles sometimes of a range of these things and I think they're rated like what, 258 or something Tom do you know that number off the top of your head You're, you may yeah know. yeah the, the the Kona is um oh geez the bolts 259 yeah I think it's 258 I think it was one right one mile less right on um and as, as you noted, we do our range tests with the Hyundai. Hyundai is inc makes incredibly efficient vehicles. They they really do meet their EPA range and even exceed it. The Ionic in particular is uh, just it's it's a beast for efficiency. So I hope that um, they manage to carry over to this vehicle. Now it's a different shape, it's bigger, so it's not going to be as efficient as say the Ionic. But Hyundai, right. like Tesla, has that special sauce for squeezing out the most efficiency out of their vehicles. 
Right. And like you, you mentioned that Ionic, so Hyundai has this sedan lift back kind of car with a, it's more, you know, it's uh, they've been selling for years as a as an electric, as a hybrid and as a plug-in hybrid. Uh, but this is like, a, they've, they've taken that name and turned it into a sub-brand. And this is the first of those, the Ionic 5. Um, so charging speed is the other big deal here. It's a zero to 80% in 18 minutes uh, plugged into a 350 kilowatt DC fast charger. Or they also say 62 miles or 100 kilometers in five minutes, which sounds impressive. I, I imagine you have to have a pretty low battery to get that kind of speed, but uh, no details on the onboard charger yet. So uh, let's start with you, Sean. Uh, what is your overall impression? Uh, this this drawing or, or concept has me quite excited. Now, I use I use those words intentionally because it 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 is it is uh, is yet to go into production. But this is this is actually quite exciting. Uh, I, I like the I like the design of it. It's almost like um, a VW Golf meets. Uh, uh, meets like a, a cyber truck, you know. It's it's got some sort of like like sharp angles on it, yeah. and uh, it 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 is it's a little bit reminiscent. I think I think Hyundai has has put out some really fantastic cars, like consistently fantastic cars that perform pretty well. And th this I would expect to to be you know no different. I think uh, it looks good. This is probably the best looking EV that I've seen from them. So so that's really promising. Um, they're, they're not in terms of style and design. I don't think that they've ever been too avant-garde or, or too forward thinking, uh, with, with design, but, uh, you know, th there's, there's a, there's a proper market for this, this type of vehicle. And if it looks close to what these, what these renders have, I think it's going to be really popular. Right. Uh, we do have some like real car, like I think these are computer, computer renderings. I think we're seeing on the screen now, but there are some, uh, there's some footage of the actual car in the metal kind of thing. And it's, it's the production, we say design. So it'll, it'll look like that pretty much. Uh, we have, uh, I think on the inside EV's site too, we have some, uh, some of the cars of the production version, like on the street without camouflage. So it looks not quite as, you know, perfect as, as these like computer renderings are, but, uh, Tom, you have, you have some thoughts about this? Yes, I do. But first, I'd like to address a couple comments. I see we had a couple comments in the sure. section. First, um, J.K. Tesla asked uh, if uh, the uh, the hood on the Bolt EUV was more difficult to see over than the EV, okay. and uh, no, it's not. I'm only five foot eight inches, and I couldn't even see the hood. So perhaps somebody who's taller might be able to see it a little, but it definitely doesn't obstruct your vision at all. Um, and then there was one more here that I wanted sure. to check out real quick. Oh yeah. Steve Myers asked when you quoted the range, is that based on European standard or U S uh, standard? And Dom was quoting the WLTP range rating, which is the European standard, not the U S standard. We find that um, uh, on average, the EPA range rating is going to be about 10 to 15% less than the WLTP range rating. Um, but that's uh, remains to be seen, Steve. Um, so uh, my impressions on it, I, I absolutely love this vehicle. Um, I kind of sound like Kyle now. Every time a new vehicle comes out, he's like, oh, my God, this is I drove it. I want to buy it or, or I totally hate it. But um, uh, I really do like this th this uh, this vehicle. And I think I was just talking to my wife about it last night. There's a good chance that I'm going to get one. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I, I it, it ticks all the boxes for me. I love the vehicle to load. I, I want to be able to to use that feature to make videos, to do all kinds of fun things with that. I mean, it, it delivers 3.6 kilowatt. I mean, that's a lot of power that this thing that's can a, put that, that this thing can put out. I mean, it can power your house. That's that you don't have, yeah, sorry. The, sorry, that's, yeah. that's, a v, that's that V2L function or a vehicle, vehicle to load, I believe. Yeah, you can plug it yeah. in. Like we're seeing on the screen here now. Sorry, sorry, sorry I, should, right. I should have cleared that up. That's um, all right. Yeah, that's where the, the vehicle itself can power, you know, external electrical devices. I mean, even, even your house. Uh, so, you know, that uh, we all, I think we all agree that the, this is where electric vehicles are going to go eventually. I think we're going to have a lot of interaction between your vehicle and your home and, and other devices. I think they're, you're, you're going to be able to use your car door power outages and so forth and so on. Um, but to have this going to be available this year, I think is, is fantastic. Uh, I'm not thrilled with the dashboard. I don't really love that look. Um, and I don't really need the fully reclining seats. One of the things I found interesting is how 
that they seem to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the reclining seats and you can, while you're charging, you can relax and recline. But then the next sentence is, oh yeah, it only takes 18 minutes to charge from, from <laughs> five to 80%. I can't get that comfortable as this woman looks in 18 minutes. I don't know about you guys. It takes me longer to totally decompress and get comfortable. So, you know, 18 minutes is, you know, you get out, you unplug, you walk inside the convenience store, use the restroom, you, you know, you buy a snack and you come out and that's 18 minutes. You're driving away. You're not, you're not reclining and relaxing. Um, I, I don't have anything against having the seats recline and relax like that. I just don't know that I would really use that feature uh, or even the center console that it slides um, forward and backwards. I guess, you know, th there might be a need or a use for that at some point, but um, you know, I, I, I've never, I've never sat in my car and said, geez, I wish this damn thing would move backwards. <laughs> so, um, you know, unless I guess I was trying to exit from the other side of the vehicle for some specific reason. But, um, you know, I, I just don't know how that's it's kind of neat to have it, but I don't know how how usable it's going to be. But I mean, for everything else the the wheelbase you mentioned earlier, Dom, is also another thing that's really amazing. Right. You know, the, the Model S, for instance, is a foot longer than this vehicle. Okay. And the, and the wheelbase is two inches shorter. Really? <laughs> yeah. You know, the Model S is a big, long yeah, so car. That's what, yeah. And and the wheelbase is two inches. And and the Model S has, a, has kind of a, a long wheelbase. You know, so that's, to put it in perspective, Hyundai really pushed these wheels out to the edges of the vehicle as much as they could. Um, I think it's going to have a good, uh, I think that's going to improve the riding comfort. I think it's going to have... Uh, the interior space is going to be fantastic. So I like everything they did with this vehicle. I believe the, the back seats move back and forth as well. Like the front seats and the center console, they, they move back and forth. But I think there's some travel in the back seats as well. I'm not exactly sure how that all works. So uh, someone mentioned about this being a great vehicle for camping because you can plug all that stuff in. And Hyundai has been you know playing that angle up a bit with some of their videos showing people like having like huge stereo systems outside on their camping trips or, or gourmet uh, kitchen appliances. You know, um, I'm not sure if we have a shot of the outlet there again, Martin, if you if you could track that down. But I believe also there's like so that V2L option, there's the, like the plug under the back seat. But there's also in the where you plug in the car on the outside, there's a I believe there's a, maybe a plug there as well. And I think maybe able to charge it like another vehicle another say so you you're going to go down the road and somebody's run out of charge you know you may be able to i don't see anything there though hmm i don't know i, I, I need to look into that but I, I thought i had read that anybody else recall hearing that no okay yeah someone mentioned yeah you can charge your your electric bicycles when you're on your drive to the trail or on your way back or whatever and has this all actually has a solar roof as well that's worth mentioning that's uh also on the uh, Sonata, I believe it, it's like 200 watts. So it's not a huge amount of power, but it might give you, you know, I don't know. I think we just, we just thought maybe like eight miles. Uh, some of the guys in the forum were talking it over. I think, you know, if it was outside all day, you know, in a relatively sunny part of the country, which is great, you know, three miles or three miles, but um, whether or not it's enough to pay over time for the, for the, op the added cost of that option, it was, it's, you know, we'll have to see what how much that option is. Um, so, Martin, did you have what, what are your thoughts on this? I know you have a you're suffering from a sore throat this week, but so, you know, <laughs> it's not don't COVID. Want to tax you too much. It's not COVID. I've had a test. It's not COVID. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, the most exciting thing for me is this is a, a, an EV designed from the ground up, flat floor. You know, how many times you have to exit into the path of traffic? If you need to, you can just scooch across. Very simple. And, uh, you know, it's nice little touches like that that are, are small, small things, first world problems, I know. But, um, uh, the, you know, the, the ability to charge from it, which is amazing. The ability to uh, have a flat floor is brilliant. The ability to have this platform roll out across Kias and Genesis as well, and maybe even licensed to others. We keep talking about Apple, but they've put, a, you know, the kibosh on that conversation. So I'm really excited about this being a platform. And just to get a bit nerdy about how the automotive industry works, you know, conversations are had in, you know, for in 10 years time when in 15 years time. And if if Hyundai Group wants to spin up a new EV, for instance, you're talking 
single years, as in one or two years, you could develop a new car and get it out. So whether that is a another form factor um, or a different body type, for instance, this platform, like VW have done, is 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 very versatile. So um, that's my most exciting thing is that it's a, it's a pure EV from the ground up, but it opens. I know you know it's not an immediate thing to get excited about, but it opens up the the future for development um and and that is really exciting because it, it doesn't mean one or two new evs it means like 20 30 40 new evs from one company right and uh, somebody mentioned about asked about availability um it's coming i believe this summer in europe in the uk um i'm not sure if i'll have the pricing here in a second uh, but uh oh yeah in uh in here, in, in here, in North America, we should see it uh, in December, I believe, if there's no delays, which, you know, like, uh, yeah, I, I have to think that it's going to be January at least. But and, maybe, maybe they'll make it. That'd be great. And, Dom, one of the questions was, will it be nationwide delivery? Oh, yes. Because if was, you remember, the, the Kona, when Hyundai re released it, was just released in carb states. Uh, but, yes, this will be a nationwide delivery at launch. Right on. And it's it's interesting that we've got, you know, Sean and Tom on this podcast because the one thing that I noticed is from Tesla owners saying, actually, this is quite impressive. Like that's like it charges quickly and um and that's you know, that's not always a common thing that you hear often an EV EV comes out and you hear Tesla fans go, Oh, that's nice, but I still like my car, thanks. And I've heard Tesla fans this week saying, Oh, that's nice. Like yeah, I would can I would consider that. Um, there's obviously things like the supercharging network, which you know is the mote of all moats, and and I just think they're secret sauce. But and how everything is fully aligned in there in that company, so I don't think it's not an it's not a no brainer for many Tesla fans. I think there's so many you know they're in the ecosystem, they're going to be in the ecosystem forever because they love it and it works really well. But mm. um, it's interesting that it seems to have risen above the kind of Mustangs, the ID fours, um, with the Tesla community as well, which is you know neither here nor there but it, it was interesting sure i think that's what you want as well you know for people who are yeah. supportive of electric vehicles you want multiples of, of viable options for evs not just one because you know tesla is fantastic but they also have their disadvantages they have their downsides and i think i think the the more more automakers that put out compelling electric vehicles the better it makes the entire industry, the better it makes Tesla. And to be quite frank, there are lots of great things about these other automakers that, that are strong suits that Tesla doesn't have yet or haven't figured out. So I think, I think you know, it, it's going to be the, the ships will rise with the tide. All ships will rise with the tide. Mm. I agree. And I think part of that, uh, Martin, is that the ve this vehicle is moving the needle. You know, I talked about that earlier with the Bolt and the Bolt EV. It, it, it doesn't move the needle. It, it's a nice well, EV. I think it'll it'll serve families well. It's it's going to be affordable. Um, but this actually, like especially with the with, with the vehicle to load f features, this is a, and and the super high speed charging. Uh, th this is moving the needle. This is giving the other automakers something to reach for. Now the interesting thing is, I think I think Lucid did that also, but Tesla uh, fans didn't don't have the same uh, reaction. To what Lucid is doing compared to what Hyundai is doing, I think that's partly because Lucid is seen as more of a direct competitor. They're a startup. They're all EV. They're you know that 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 the, it's too close to home for Tesla fans to give Lucid credit. But for Hyundai, that's fine. Oh yeah, this is great. You know, a legacy OEM is finally mm. doing something that's going to actually you know as, in, inspire the industry to start making better electric vehicles. I think that's part of it. And I don't think we've got pricing for this yet in the for North America, right? But we do for the UK for sure, um, or some of the. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're in the UK, and I guess they've had some problems with their website crashing and different things, but they've also reached out afterwards and got in touch with people who are trying to reserve vehicles. And I believe they have a launch edition, which is, I believe it's fully loaded. I'm not sure, but I see 45,000 pounds. I don't know. How does that compare to uh, something comparable over there, Martin? It's not it's not cheap, but it's in yeah, they gave the they gave the fully loaded price, which is an interesting tactic rather than the entry level price for the rear wheel drive small battery. Right. But um uh it compares with ID four, Skoda ENIAC IV, uh fully loaded versions of that. So it would be um yeah, and you're right, it was uh, it was it was a frustrating moment because it was another 
example of a massive company with lots of resources and lots of really good people working in it just cocking up massively and it makes you wonder how it keeps happening with these big car companies around ev launches and i don't want to be too harsh but equally i feel like i i can be harsh because you know they're a big company with good people like good marketing people good website people on the day they launched it um you click on buy now and it's an error 404 page. They hadn't turned it on for 24 hours. Now, my buddy who runs a Hyundai dealership and a really successful one as well, um, people were tweeting him saying, I want to buy it and I can't buy it. And how do I buy one? And he hadn't been told, and this is his business and this is his livelihood. And right. he pays Hyundai a lot of money every year to be one of their dealers. So he was replying on Twitter. I literally don't know. I believe Hyundai Europe are looking after it. Hyundai's official account replied to him, hey, thanks for your interest. Here's a link if you want to find your nearest dealer. And like he didn't reply because he's too nice and a professional and obviously has a relationship with them. So I replied, he is a dealer. It's like, <laughs> and it's like, obviously it's like the social media kid or the intern just trying to be helpful. It's not their fault, but in a way, so right. I was, you know, uh, I hate criticizing, but no, go it, ahead, you know, they, yeah. they had, it, it, they it, wasn't, it. it wasn't sprung upon them. They knew right. that day was coming. They knew they had to turn not. So yeah, Hyundai Duck at UK slash Ionic Five, whatever it was, was just a blank page. And you think, ha, huh, okay. So so as far as I know, no one's been able to order one in this country because they sold out. They they it was it was the European bit of Hyundai that looked after it, and allocation's gone this year. So uh, then no one I know the people were trying to buy one and were told, oh, they've all gone now in the right. first hour or two. So uh, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. So. Super popular, but also super aggravating trying to get an actual hold of one. And I, I have to say on, on the PR side, also not super organized. Like they had a teaser video and then they had the sequel to the teaser video that came out. I don't know where, where I couldn't find it. They have some people found some B-roll footage or some really nice footage of the car. Looking, like it's not on the media site. I have no there's idea. Like where a whole movie. There's like a, like an, I won't there's a movie. Much, there's a, there's a couple different things. There's, but uh, yeah. But you know, forget about trying to find them. Uh, you know, well, this one, yeah, this one is now available on, on YouTube. I'm not even sure if it's on the Hyundai site or not, but on the Hyundai the channel. Camera? It's like a, it's a whole movie. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop. Yeah, it yeah, it is great. No, it's it's we worth get, checking out if you can because it, it kind of it's kind of a, a you know you get to see the car actually moving around in action. It's and it's not the most annoying you know fake drama or dramatization <laughs> or whatever. It's kind of okay. That's interesting. Um, I I don't want to pile on because I love the car, yeah. but. Yeah, the, the launch was really botched. Uh, I don't want to really get into it, but um, we're talking about multiple events that were sent. We, we got calendar invites, then they were canceled, and then you oh, got yeah. another calendar invite. And it, the whole thing, I, I was so confused about when we actually had, because we had a private press preview, and, and I had three invitations sent to me, and, and two of them were canceled. And I was trying to go through my emails to figure out when is this thing? And uh, and then the, when the embargo ended, changed, and then and then so we had the uh, the 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 reveal, and then like the two days later, Hyundai's email system got messed up and started sending us all invites to the uh, <laughs> to, to the launch event, and and uh, and just blasting all, all you know email blasts, and people are responding to it like, what the hell is going on here? Like you did this two days ago. Why are you sending me this now? Is there another event? And uh, you know they were like, no, our email system's messed up. So like, oh, like, I love the car, uh, but like Hyundai really had some issues around the launch of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, a viewer asks, "Will there be a Kia version of the Ionic?" And there will be. Um, that's going to be probably revealed before too long. Now we don't even have the actual name for it yet. Um, I think they've been calling it the. I keep getting mixed up. It's CV or maybe it's LV. I don't know. Maybe someone remembers. Sean, do you do you know what? No. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Look out for the Kia and also a Genesis version, which will be an upscale. Uh, you know, a version of this as well, and a little more expensive, but somehow nicer. I think I was wondering if there's going to be a spicier version on the Hyundai. Like Hyundai has this like N, N sporty line, and I'm not. I was thinking maybe it, it would get that, but I read somewhere else where Kia might get the sporty version as well. Uh, so that's something to look out for because uh, yeah, it's, it's, I remember seeing a headline about it doing the Kia version doing uh, zero to sixty in three seconds, which is. Kind of crazy. This one does it in 5.2 seconds, 
for at least the European big battery all-wheel drive version. It'll be interesting to see. What which, which is more than fast enough. We oh, Sometimes yeah. we focus too much on zero to 60. Every car doesn't need to be a track car. You know, oh. uh, yeah, electric vehicles are fast. They're fun to drive. Like five seconds, zero to 60. Just a few years ago, like that was only the top sports, sports cars. cars. Yeah, You know what I mean? You talked about... You wanted a, a Mustang uh, 5.0, Sean, when when you were a teenager. Um, I, 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 you know, and you were probably in the 80s when I wasn't. Uh, you know, my my best friend had one, and uh, you know, I what was the zero to sixty on that back then? Like we thought it was so oh, fast. Geez. I think it was like six point eight or something like that. Like it's slow today, and that was like our like nothing beat a 5.0. You know, so um, you know, it's all relative. Uh, you know, we need to stop focusing on zero to sixty. Right, especially like for a family car, you know. Go ahead. Yeah. Not everyone cares about zero to sixty. I mean, the, the yeah. acceleration, the instant acceleration, is really nice because sometimes you need that to get out of harm's way or yeah. to pass Merging. someone. But not everyone is looking for the fastest zero to sixty. There are other features that are more important than a vehicle. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, you, you hit the nail right on the head, Sean. You you need to be able to accelerate into into traffic in, onto the highway. There's an intersection where I live that's really hard. You know, at a stoplight, I have to. Uh, I mean, a stop sign. I have to get out onto this very busy road. And I love how my Model Three. I don't need a big window. You know, I can I can as the cars are coming, I can be like, okay, I can do this one, punch it, and it just boom, I'm out. You know, in traffic, that's great. Um, yeah. uh, but you only need that short burst. It doesn't have to be a quarter mile track car. All right. So let's move on to the next thing. I guess we're doing pretty good on time. So uh, Hyundai was also in the news this week for not great reasons. Um, it decided to recall 82,000 vehicles, electric vehicles, due to battery fires. Uh, that's pretty much all the Kona electrics sold, or 76,680 of them. 15 have gone up in flames, mostly in South Korea, but also a couple in Canada and a couple in Europe. Uh, also involved in the recall are 5,716 Hyundai Ioniq electrics. That's that uh, their, their sedan liftback vehicle that uh, I mentioned a little while ago. Um, they've been selling those for some time. And on top of that, they're also recalling 305 electric buses. I, I didn't even know they made electric buses, but there you go. Uh, and one of those experienced a fire earlier this month. I think we had a story on that on Inside EVs. Um, we don't think this number includes the Hyundai electrics, the Kona electrics that were built in the Czech Republic, however. So these are just the ones in uh, from South Korea. Uh, it's it's going to cost them like a, a trillion won. That's the uh, South Korean currency, which is about $900 million. $900 million. Uh, the replacement of the battery packs will start on March the 29th, 2021. Um, so, yeah, uh, we have, like we said, we have a lot of owners in our form, inside of this form. So it'll be interesting to track how the... Uh, how they do that whole thing because and actually good for them if they got a lot of miles in their car they're gonna they're getting a fresh battery it's kind of nice yeah i think this is this is a, a smart move to be proactive about this safety should always be first yes it's expensive yes unfortunately some cars have, have caught fire which I, I didn't realize but uh, safety of the consumers is uh of, of, of the utmost importance so i'm um uh, you know the silver lining in this as you've mentioned dominic is that they're going to get brand new battery packs, which, which is great. Right. Yeah. And the thing with the thing with battery fire, with cars, electric vehicles, you know, catching fire, this is, I think maybe happening if, if it's happening when they're charging, it's in your house. It's like, there's a good chance it's in your garage. You know, it's not out on the curb, you know, where it's, you know, they're not going to hurt anything. It's like, it's in, in, in at, at night, you know? So if you do have an electric or any vehicle, really, you should have, and you park your car in your garage, make sure you have a smoke detector in your garage. I'll, I'll just say that regardless of, because gas vehicles go up more, just as often and more often, you know, it's, it's a thing. Uh, even brand new vehicles of whatever kind, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, pickup trucks burning like on test drives before. So it, it's a thing that happens occasionally. Well, the thing, uh, Dom, the thing about that makes, in my opinion, makes it a little bit worse is you're not just relying on the vehicle. Uh, to be safe and not have a fire. When you're when you're talking about charging an electric car, now you're introducing another you know a, a, another way that the fire can happen. Right. If your outlet isn't wired correctly, if you're using a, an extension cord that's not proper, if you're if you're if your EVSE 
um, is, isn't so, so it's not just the vehicle. There are other things that can happen, which is why you need to be absolutely safe. And, and I always recommend don't do your own home wiring for electric Never. vehicle uh, uh, service equipment. I know maybe it doesn't seem hard. You want to save a couple hundred bucks. Your, your car is going to be charging all night while you sleep. It's not worth it. Have an electrician do it for you. Um, you know, 100%. But one of the things I want to circle back to was that one of the points that Sean made was that it was great that, um, um, the, that they're going to be replacing all these battery packs. And my, my point about that is it's great for the owner of the vehicle. That's it. It's not great for Hyundai and it's not great for the industry because we're already battery constrained across the world. And this is 82,000 battery packs that could be going in new vehicles. Yes. Um, and if we're, if we are indeed, you know, capacity constrained by batteries, this is virtually 82,000 less electric vehicles that are going to be on the road in the next year or two or right. potentially. So, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's actually very bad in my opinion for the industry that, that this large of a block of battery packs are, are just going to get used and put in cars that have already been on the road. So it's not, that's a great point, uh, Tom. Um, it's not clear at this point, what's the response for this problem. Uh, LG, there's a lot of finger pointing. LG said in a statement that Hyundai misapplied LG suggestions for fast charging logic in the battery management system, adding that the battery cell should not be seen as a direct cause of the fire, um, which is kind of interesting because uh, this is LG also makes the battery that uh, goes in the Chevy Bolt EV, which and that has had a recall for 68,677 of those vehicles. And those cells, we understand, are slightly different, a different separator, I believe uh, GM is saying. Um, and GM has just actually said that they figured out the issue and they can prevent uh, any fire, any further fires with a software update. There's been a, a two or three or something Chevy Bolt fires, but out of like, you know, tens of thousands sold. So it's not terrible, but any potential fire is not great. Because, um, you know, we want EVs to be better than what's come before, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll address the question there. None of those packs are going to landfill, by the way. Batteries are still too valuable. Oh, yeah. even, their, even their component parts to be recycled are too valuable. But in their, in their form that they are in, they can be used for stationary storage. If it means that a different use of the BMS in terms of only going to 70, 80, 90% um, state of charge to make sure they're safe. Uh, but even if there is something fundamentally wrong with these cells, and I don't, and I don't think there is, um, they can still be recycled. And But no no batteries go to landfill um and actually you know tesla have been putting batteries in new cars quietly and i make a song and dance about it but you know the amount of the amount of used s's old s's that you see on the market and it'll just say in the description oh i had its new battery pack at a hundred thousand miles or whatever um they've been doing this for a long time and none of those packs have gone to landfill um tesla don't take them back that but th th they'll go on to uh, companies that will either break them down at module level or sell them on to enthusiasts or people that are doing um you know mods and conversions and classic cars so you know don't worry about that there's, there's not a battery going to landfill anywhere they're just too valuable yeah i was kind of wondering what they're going to do with these if they're going to make it do it like i kind of like would like to see like a stationary storage um you know things set up you know maybe hyundai could do some experiments with that or maybe i don't know if the risk is too much uh yeah so it might they just might end up all being recycled, I guess. I don't Sean, did you have any insight on that? No, okay. Um so uh let's move on from that. Um yeah, let's skip that. Hyundai is also buying some batteries for other uh future EVs from uh not well, they're gonna do some from LG for LG too, like the Ionic 7, I believe will have LG though that's but that's way in the future. Uh, but they're also buying from SK Innovation and uh, the Chinese company Cattle, CATL, um, for some of the eGMP vehicles coming after 2023. So let's talk about an American automaker, uh, an American EV automaker. Uh, Lucid has made official what we had, what many had expected. It will merge with Churchill Capital Corporation for a special purpose acquisition company or SPAC. Um, it will be the largest EV SPAC deal that we've seen. This is another way for a company to go public instead of doing like the initial public offering uh, with, with banks and everything. They, they just merge with an existing company that's already on the stock exchange. 
Uh, it will be the largest SPAC deal we've seen, and it will provide Lucid with $4.4 billion in cash for further expansion. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what this means in financial speak, but the pro forma equity value of the combined company will be $24 billion. Um, if you looked at the stock of this, like EV stocks have been really hot and all, there's been a bunch of these SPAC kind of deals and they've been super hot, but just like in this last week, the, a lot of them have kind of crashed. Like I think uh, the Churchill the capital stock had gone up to like to $59 at some point and it was, it's down like 27, I think yesterday it was, it's been a, you know, I think uh, this is not financial advice, but I am not a financial advisor. Um, but I do think that the value of the company will will regain some of that. I'm not sure. I don't know where. I have no idea how far up it's going to bounce back to. But um, I do expect that. Anyone want to say anything about that? I, I mean, it, the, the company seems very hopeful. I think uh, I think they're going to do well. My only concern is the price point. How right. many of these, how many of these vehicles will they be able to sell? Uh, you know, north of a hundred thousand dollars. It seems like a good car. It looks good. It seems like their their core technology has, has been well thought out and well developed. So I personally have have a lot of hope and promise for the company. I did hold a position uh, when I started hearing about the rumors because, okay. um, but I since sold it and, and did 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 well on it. Awesome. Good. Uh, but but uh, I'm I'm optimistic. I think I, I would not be surprised if we see Rivian uh, go public and if for, for for an even larger amount. Right. But the fact that they're they're doing this, I think, is going to give them some extra cash to be able to to continue uh, production and the launch of their vehicle, and I think it's a good thing. Yep, R Rivian announced uh, they will be doing an IPO, and I believe that's coming later this year. So, and that's uh, usually with IPOs. There's a, a lot more money involved, so this might be a big SPAC deal. But the Rivian deal, I think, is going to be like an, on another level because, like you say, this is. We're like kind of smallish numbers here, right? For, you know, luxury sedan, you're not going to sell a, a million of those. But uh, the Rivian's got, you know, huge deals, even with, with Ford and with uh, Amazon and its own vehicles. And uh, uh, yeah. So along with this good news, though, there is some bad uh, for Lucid Air reservees. Uh, instead of spring 2021, um, you can expect their, what they're calling their cars post luxury uh, i don't know why uh, uh but instead so instead of this spring they're only going to be coming out late summer or autumn possibly so that's kind of a bummer we've got like a customer asking about that uh this this week on the uh, inside evs forum you know he's waiting for his car and uh he's you know chomping at the bit and now he's man it's it's a it's kind of a, very disappointing but you know we're also in a in a global pandemic and so you know things happen as they say um so i also want so moving right along um we also learned some some about uh, we also learned some things about lucid's future product plans uh, besides the lucid gravity suv which is like a full-size suv we've seen pictures of you can search for lucid gravity on the inside of each site and you'll see pictures of that from spy shots from uh, months ago but they also intend to make a, like a, a model a tesla model 3 rival and a pickup truck, which strikes me as kind of weird. And uh, I think there's a probably a, a smaller SUV in there as well. Uh, they want to have six products by 2030. The Air, the SUV Gravity, a premium sedan, a premium SUV, a premium coupe, which kind of sounds interesting, and the pickup truck. Um, and they, I think they have, they have uh, some large expectations for you know volume of the pickup truck too. I'm like, I, f I forget exactly what they were, but... I don't know. Is this a, is this a pickup truck brand, Tom? Tom, everybody can be a pickup truck brand in the <laughs> U.S. You know, we, we, we buy 3 million pickup trucks per year in this country. In the top three selling vehicles in the U.S. are pickup trucks. The F-150 is number one, the Chevy Silverado is number two, and the Dodge pickup truck, Dodge Ram is number three. And in the top 10, five of the vehicles are pickup trucks. So why wouldn't, if you have a platform that that Lucid has that they're going to make the, the, the SUV on, why wouldn't you, if you can use that platform? It, it, and the market share on pickup trucks keeps increasing. In 2020, it was more than 20%. 
one in every five new vehicle sold in the U.S. was a pickup truck. Why wouldn't you want a piece of that if, if you're know. an automaker? I don't know. Pick, pick pickup truck, man. <laughs> they sell. You got to make what people are buying. That's yeah. why. Well, that's why we we don't import. We don't sell small hatchbacks here anymore. Uh, you know, I think we, you know we. I like a small hatchback. Uh, Dom, you like small hatchbacks, but I do. They, they don't sell them here anymore because it's. I don't know. Nobody else does. They they right. just don't sell well in the U.S. They're gonna they're they're gonna you know give us what we ask for and. Right, right now, this country is asking for pickup trucks. Right. So, well, you know, and automakers make a lot. If you don't sell them, automakers make a lot more money on, on pickup trucks you than they do small hatchbacks. Yeah, as well. well yeah, they really get a lot of volume on hatchbacks. To, to, you know, to make any money. So Tom's got his Cybertruck reservation. In Sean, have you got yours? Oh, two <laughs> Cybertruck owners. <laughs> I, I was resistant initially. I was at the event and and a little bit uh, slack jawed by by the look of it, even though even though Elon said it was crazy looking. Right. And it took me about, let's see, I, uh, the event was in November, I think, of 2019. It took me until September of the following year, right after I got coal rolled by a diesel pickup truck. I mean, bad. It was and it was intentional too. And so I just I had it like I, I was just done with with being the the small guy on the road. So that was what pushed me over the edge. <laughs> Reminds me of that comic comic when we were kids uh, or when I was a kid. Um, I'm probably older than most of you guys. Um, there's a little comic of the the guy kicking sand in, in his face, and so it was like an ad for a, a workout program or something. Anyway, uh, Mueller's. Whatever. Anyway, so but Sean, Sean uh, I, I have to comment really quickly. Sean, I was in the same situation as you, and I call it like the five stages of uh, of Cybertruck adoption. You know, <laughs> your, your your initial thought was like, ha ha ha, like yeah, nice joke, and then you're like, stage two is like, oh my god, they're serious. This is actually what they're going to try to sell. Stage three is, I hate it. How could they possibly do this to us? Stage four is it's not that bad. And then stage five is I got to have one. And you're on the site putting your deposit down. So like so many people that I've talked to have gone through those five stages. So I think you've reinforced that. <laughs> and uh, Elon was just saying this week that they've got, they've come, they finally, uh, they have the final design of the truck. Uh, I mean, it should look pretty much like we, what we see here on the screen. It should be pretty much what they showed. But I mean, there will be some small changes, but. Yeah, so but it still will be interesting to see because there was talk about it being bigger or smaller and it was going back and forth. So it'll be interesting to see what they finally d decided on. Uh, speaking of pickup trucks, real quick, there's a uh, the Lord Lordstown Motors, which is uh, they they're in Lordstown, Ohio, and they they bought the GM factory that I believe. Um, they have a pickup truck coming out. It's got the Inwheel Motors in it, uh, and they're in, they are entering. A version of that into the into the San Felipe 250 uh, electric uh, race. They have a racetrack. There's a race. There, it's a 290 mile single loop race scheduled for April the 17th, 2021. And they're gonna they have a track. They're gonna put it into it. And man, it's kind of a risky move, but you know it should be interesting to see how that all goes. I think at the top of this, uh, we're looking at the YouTube uh, at the post. If you go right to the very top, there might be a click on that. It should be a picture of it coming up. It looks pretty much like their production truck, but you can tell it's not production. It's not their production truck. So it looks kind of. I don't actually. I kind of like, think I like this more than their production truck. <laughs> but um, it, it'll be interesting because they haven't, you know, produced anything. And they're, actually, their their very first vehicle, their like demo vehicle, burned to the ground recently. Um, so, you know, if things go wrong. It's not going to be great, but I think so good. It's a it's a risky move. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, uh, speaking of things going wrong, Tesla's Fremont factory was partially shut down this week, but it's reopened again. Uh, it's been really, really quiet, but uh, Sawyer Mayor, I believe his name is, uh, you know, a fan and uh, a good source of information about Tesla on Twitter, uh, had mentioned that he, some people on the inside he, he received words that at least some of the uh, some of the factory had been shut down, and that got verified that actually yes. And and uh, but by the time everyone figured out yes, it was shut down. Elon Musk uh, said it's back up again, so it was shut down for two days because of part shortages. Um, I did see on Bloomberg. I think they mentioned that workers 
uh, might not get paid for a few days or they were encouraged to take uh, vacation days if they had any, which I think personally sucks. Uh, this is not really electric vehicle related, but you know, it's not a unionized shop. So the uh, workers are kind of, you know, at, at, at the mercy of, you know, a management basically, uh, which is a, sh a shame because I don't know, I have, you know, you have your vacation days for, and then, I don't know, you have your plans for your vacation later this summer. And then, you, then all of a sudden the factory is putting you out of work for a few days and you have to make ends meet. So I don't know. Anyway, that's it rubs, rubs me a bit the wrong way, but that's, that's what you want to come and work over here. And if I say over here, I mean in Europe. And when I say right. Europe, I mean France. <laughs> <laughs> because then you'll be fine. You'll be absolutely right. fine. So, Very yeah, strong I, labor I, laws. I always get uh, really surprised when I see stuff, you know, that you talk about right. US US things because you know very that Tesla will have it different in Berlin. That's for sure. There'll be have, no you can go home now today because the German unions are very very strong. They have unions over there. That's, that's oh, a whole different yeah. discuss, discussion. Oh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not that's, really a whole, that's a whole different podcast. I can tell you about right. uh, employment I'm, I'm, law over here in in Europe. Yeah, I'm not really a, a big union person, which is. Odd because my I'm, my my dad's side of the family were, were coal miners and huge union is you know a big deal. Um, I just think we should have a good laws that so they're not necessary you know basically because mm. I just hate the idea of you know I already pay taxes I have to pay union dues as well as <laughs> you know but anyway so moving on uh, Oshkosh uh, as a defense company. Uh, will electrify this part of the U.S. Postal Service fleet. They won the award. They won the contract for the uh, U.S. Post Office trucks, but only 10% of them, I think, are going to be electric. And it looks, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see what it looks like on the screen. Um, I don't know if you all have some words to describe that exactly. <laughs> There's not uh, enough time to get into this. We need a <laughs> show on this. It looks on the surface like it terrible deal hopefully it can be stopped in my opinion i think dejoy who's the postmaster general um you know it seems like a good old boys backroom deal a defense contractor you know that makes tactical you know uh vehicles for war you know got this contract and um you know very small percentage of the fleet is going to be electric vehicles and uh, let's face it what 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 vehicle is better other than maybe a, a airport shuttle bus or something for, for electrification than a, a mail truck that has a short route that does a repeatable route every day. They don't go very far. Um, you know, and uh, it, it just, it's, it's mind boggling. Um, and, and the funny thing is I, my initial reaction and I, and like 20 other people that I know on Twitter, their initial reaction was like, wait a minute, DeJoy is still postmaster general right. a, 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 after January 20th. Like how, how did, how did that happen? But it did. And yes, he is. And uh, let's just hope that this isn't the final say on this. This can be reevaluated and perhaps reversed. So I think uh, he's, yeah, there's some pushback. He, he was in hearings or something this week and he, he told lawmakers that, you know, to get used to him, he's going to be there for a while. But I think they're working, he's not appointed by the administration, but I think they're working on ways to remove him. They're, he's not, you know, politically popular with, with the new administration. Um, so it just seems, it seems odd. Again, I'm a uh, million miles away from the situation. It seems odd that you have um, your president. We seem to have lost. You've, you've frozen on us, Martin. Mm, okay. Well, we'll just keep moving on uh, because yeah, we're a little, a little over time, but we got a couple more things we want to hit anyway. Oh, he's even dropped all the way off. Okay. Um, so Tesla has, I think he's trying to get back on Tesla has cut the price of the model three and model Y long range versions. Uh, last week we were talking about the short range, right? Getting a thousand dollar cuts. Uh, this week we have, uh, cuts to the model three long range, all wheel drive and the model Y long range, all, all wheel drive long range. Sean, have you did you see this? It's like a thousand yeah, bucks. Yeah. yeah, I know a lot of people make a big fuss about Tesla dropping their prices multiple times in a year. Mm, but right. I always found that that criticism very odd. What we don't know is what is what what are Tesla's uh, efficiencies with production, and I would I would guess that as they get more 
cost efficient with producing vehicles if they're passing that savings along to the buyer, which puts electric vehicles into the hands of more people. So this is what you want to do. This is what Henry Ford did with, with, with his vehicles in, in the early days. Uh, he dropped the price so it would be more affordable. To me, this is this is just a part of getting more electric vehicles on the road. Right. Yeah, there's been some some back and forth about why. But, you know, uh, Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla, is very adamant that they're not lowering prices because there's a, the, uh, there's a drop in demand. They are, they are, he says, very battery constrained. They can't. They can't produce enough batteries, you know, to supply all the vehicles they, they need to produce. But you still have, you know, short sellers. I think Gordon Johnson was mentioned uh, by Bloomberg on in their piece um, as saying, you know, demand is, I don't know if they use the word falling off a cliff, but you know, he thinks demand is very soft. Well, I, mean I think that's... Time, of, time will tell, right? We, we look at the, the quarterly quarterly numbers here very soon. Now... Let's not forget, and everyone seems to do this, especially short, short sellers around Q1, it's traditionally soft for the whole in, entire automotive industry. So, you know, are they going to, you know, let, let's take a snapshot in 12 months and find out where Tesla did. The, the, the demand right. problems have, have yet to materialize for Tesla. Each year they continue to sell more. And, you know, whether they hit their, their, their goal this year, um, I think it's optimistic. I'm optimistic about it personally, but you know, uh, demand being soft for Q1 happens every single year for the automotive industry. So short sellers will be able to, to sort of credit themselves with this, but uh, let's take a look at 12 months. Uh, how, many, how many vehicles they produce? Is it more? Is it less? Then, then we have a discussion. Right, exactly. Um, what was that comment that was just up? Um, how, right, how is Tesla changing prices any different from GM changing incentives month to month? That's a very good point. Uh, GM has thrown like a lot of money on the hood of a bolt. If you want a good, good deal on a brand new electric vehicle and you're not too fussy about interiors, um, the Bolt EV can be had for under twenty five thousand dollars, twenty four thousand. My local dealer, with before you get in there and start doing you know any horse trading or whatever, twenty four thousand dollars for a two hundred fifty some mile electric vehicle is a great deal. But you know that, but that's a lot of that is behind the scenes, and so that's you know. If there, I don't, I won't say it's a demand issue, but it's probably a demand issue in the Bolt's case it's because they're asking, they're asking too much money. You get into, you know, thirty some thousand, seven or eight thousand dollars for the Bolt, the first gen Bolt TV. You get in it and you think, mm, I got in. Uh, this is not a thirty-seven thousand whatever dollar car. This is, you know, this is a value vehicle. And now, it's, but for twenty-four thousand all day long, I would buy one. Uh, that would be my next car, and it, and it might be um, actually. Because I'm a value customer. I, I mean, that's that's what I look for. Well, Tom, um, wait till the 2022s start showing up in dealerships. If there's any 2021s left over, right? Um, you think the discounts are big now? You know, they they will want them off the lot. So it might be worthwhile hanging on uh, to checking out those prices in the you know somewhere in the summer on both inventory. You right. might be able to pick one up for like 20 grand. It's, it's like a a little balance because I also have to look at the um, the used value of my Spark EV. If I wait too long, it's going to drop. Even it's going to drop more in value. So I need to get maximum money out of that, and I can still get. I think I can sell my Spark EV for almost what I paid for it, like a year and a half ago. At this point, and it's because it only's got twenty some thousand miles on it, like low twenties. So, um, but anyway, that's just my situation. Um, so I don't know if we wanted to say anything more about that price cut, but um, there is something about availability. Oh yes, the last I think we said the Tesla Model Y standard range was was canceled, but that's not exactly the case. It's been it's still available, uh, but it's off menu. So I guess Elon doesn't like the fact that it doesn't have a, a, the range that he would like to see on a, on a Tesla vehicle on their on their site. So it's not on their site. But if you want one, it's available. You just have to call up a call up a store and. Uh, as ask them about getting yourself one. Um, now, Dom, are we sure that you can order one, or are they selling like in, in you know existing inventory? Uh, that I don't know. Uh, well, this is this is one they haven't sold. I have to look into it. I, I can't answer it right off the top of my head. Accurately. Yeah, because that would be important to know. Like they might, it mm -hmm. might be off menu because they're just selling out. You know, the 
couple thousand that they that they still have sitting in the parking lot. Um, you might not be able to order one to spec, but I'm just I'm just speculating here. I'm I, I'm just curious. Right, maybe Sean might have some insight on that. Nope. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, hit a couple things real quick on the way out. Um, so EV availability. So the the Tesla Model Y standard range is still available. The Volkswagen ID4 US deliveries are set now to begin in March. Uh, I called up my dealer uh, after driving the, uh, the Mach-E, Mustang Mach-E. I thought, mm, I want to try out the VW ID4 now. And I called up my dealer and they don't have, they know it's coming sometime, like this month or very soon. But they couldn't, they don't have one yet. Tom, you have one in your driveway at this very moment. And we'll, we look forward to hearing about that next week. I guess you're going to be driving it in the rain. I'm going to be driving it in about 20 minutes. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to have it for the next three days. And uh, unfortunately it's supposed to rain here the next two days really badly. So today's my day with good weather. It's nice and sunny. As soon as the podcast's over, I'm going to be out there um, doing a 70 mile an hour range test, do some DC charging videos and getting as much uh, recorded as I can today uh, before the, the bad weather comes in. JK Tesla says my ID4 is in the ocean now. Uh, hopefully he means on the ocean, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> that's, that's, the ID4 should be a good value. It's uh, I believe it's a little bit it's cheaper than the um, the Tesla Model Y, which which is a good competitor for it, and possibly the, the Mach E as well. Um, I, yeah, I think it's I think it's cheaper than the Mach E, but so and a decent range. So I I'll, I look forward to hearing all about it next week, Tom. Um, other EVs coming available. Uh, Rivian has reconfirmed that R1T, its pickup truck deliveries, will begin in June, as they as they said. So no no new delays there. So that's great news. And finally, from across the ocean, there on your side of things, oh, we have some video here of the Rivian R1T in the snow. Oh yeah, I love this thing. I, you love this too, Sean, right? Yeah. Yes. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's a very compelling vehicle. Um, you know, I don't particularly like the design of the truck as much mm -hmm. as the SUV. I really like the SUV a lot, right. but, um, they've been working really hard on this. I, I, I know some of the team members there and this is just a well thought out vehicle. Their vehicles are not afterthoughts. They're not compliance vehicles. These will be very compelling cars and they will, they will compete head on with with what Tesla offers. I you know, I think their their um their competitor is more like Range Rover, uh Jeep. They look really off-road capable. Like some of the footage that we've seen them scrambling up Rocky Hill is it's just really compelling. Yeah, in deep sand, snow, whatever, water up to it. Yeah. It's just man, I love I can't wait to get into one of these things. All right. Well, thank that brings us to the end of our show. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments on about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside Eves podcast post, the YouTube comment section, or on the Inside Eves forum podcast thread. And don't forget you can find our find and follow our, our panelists on Twitter. Uh, Tom Longney is at Tomlog. Martin Lee is at Even News Daily. Uh, Sean, what is your Twitter handle? Sean M. Mitchell. All right, you can, and you can search Sean Mitchell on, on Twitter, and he'll pop up there as well. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. C click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications, and we'll see you all again next week. Ciao. Thanks, guys.